Good morning. Today is Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. Uh, the committee, this is the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. We're resuming our work on S213, an act relating to the regulation of wetlands, river corridor development, and dam safety. Um, we're going to do uh, a read through and markup of draft 3.1. Um, council is on his way here right now. And we are in that, uh, I'd say, happy end phase on a bill where we have a markup, we have a room full of people with expertise and experience, and we'll do a read through if there is a question, concern, anything as we read through a section. Please, you know, raise your hand, flag us down. We'll have a discussion. The, the goal is to resolve as many of the open items as possible this morning. I am uh, tediously referred to it as painting ourselves out of the room, but we will march towards the door uh, and eliminate questions, make edits, and have a clean next draft uh, to be voted, I hope, uh, tomorrow. So, Mr. O'Grady, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Jones, it's yeah. just the background noise. I, I, don't know. I don't know what it is. It's coming from my like hard drive. So now it's chewing the wires. <laughs> I ask for need help. So I apologize. Right. Nothing else I can do. Everything is, sound is all off. Hopefully, mm -hmm. someone's on the way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, Thank you, Mr. Gray, for um, getting us a draft even over the weekend um, so that we have more time to look and read. Just before you come in, I was saying people will do a read through again, um, and then I've asked people to flag us down if they have concerns, edits, things. Uh, to the extent we can, I'd like to get all the way through the read through. There may be some things where we'll say, Okay, this is a big enough open item that we're going to flag it and we're going to need to double back. Um, but to the extent possible, if we can close things out, that would be great. All right, so uh, off to you, Mr. Reddy. And I think you've done this. Uh, how about if we read, let's just start from the beginning. The whole bill or just the changes? Um, let's go light on the whole bill part and slow it hit. Cap okay. the brakes for the changes. So the first section is the water management, water resources management policy. It adds uh, protection of wetlands underneath that policy. Section two adds a definition of dam removal to the definitions um, for wetlands, the wetlands chapter. Page two, section three. This is the requirement to update the significant, significant wetlands inventory maps. Uh, there was a request, I believe it was from the agency on Friday to say, and not less than annually, because they may update it um, more frequently than annually. And then on page two, line 17, in the incorporation of <clears throat> municipal wetlands maps, it had previously had them incorporated into the wetlands advisory level. Um, I don't want to mischaracterize the agency, but I think the agency was saying that at some point the advisory level is going to go away. So instead of it being incorporated into the advisory level, it's incorporated into the significant wetlands inventory maps. Okay. So uh, again, for if anyone has concerns, I'm, I'm going to assume that our our conversation last week led to getting it right. If you're feeling like we're not there yet, don't be shy about it. Uh, and if I don't see your hand, say something, please. I'm trying to look around and read, and sometimes I miss people. Listen. Moving on, page three, uh, subsection B and sec four in the directive for a &R to complete high quality wetlands inventory plus level mapping. For all tactical basins, you had a addition that the agency shall update the tactical basin map when it determines it is necessary. Miss um, um, Avery. Yes, this is Karina Daly, restoration ecologist with the NRC. Um, our position, advocates' position on this, is that we would like to strike that sentence. It doesn't it doesn't add to the paragraph in a way that's helpful in our opinion. 
Um, I don't know if this language originally with agency, so Ms. Smith, can you speak to it a little bit? This is Hannah Smith with the Agency of Natural Resources. The last sentence that states the agency shall update the map when it determines necessary, it is our intention to update these maps as necessary. I do have one technical correction, and this is my own fault because I think I'd, I had included this language, but um, <clears throat> on page three, starting line five, it talks about the agency shall evaluate the need for tactical basin map updates. It should be NWI plus map updates. Um, we're talking about the NWI map. Um, and we are, the, the bill asks us to complete that mapping on a basin wide level, which will be done, but um, it's, not, it's not actually called a tactical basin map, it's the NWI map. Okay. Yeah. So, it would be NWI plus map on line six, and then I guess not. It wouldn't be an issue if we strike the last sentence. But it says tactical basin map. Um. <clears throat> so the last sentence uh, is necessary. What, <clears throat> without that sentence there at all, I, I don't know that we're. I mean, it doesn't. I can give you a little bit of background. So I think that sentence was added after Senator McCormick had made had expressed a concern about. Um, evaluate the need to update the NWI maps, but then evaluate the need and update if needed. And so that sentence was added as as a way to further flush out that update if needed. But I'm not sure that it it helps with that. Uh, I don't think it has much effect legally because the agency has the ability to update when necessary anyway. Yeah. And it's totally permissive as opposed to an obligation. Well, so then it's, we might say it's superfluous. So then maybe it's worth deleting. We're telling them this language, the legislature is telling the agency that it shall do something. And what it shall do is do what it wants. That's really what we're saying. Um, since it's uh, not a big deal one way or the other, for now let's let the language stand and uh, we can come back to it if it becomes a concern, a deeper concern, okay? On page three, section four, this is the net gain of wetlands policy and state goal. A couple of drafts ago, there was uh, reference to the term development on line 15 and then again on line 20. And there had been a proposal to replace development because development is not used in the wetlands rule with the word impacted. But then if you go through the rest of this section, the section, the trigger is not impact, it's adverse effects. And so I would suggest replacing impact with adverse the affected or adverse effects. Right. <clears throat> yeah, let's align that language. Okay. Uh, thank you. Say that one more time. Can we what the if, what are so you doing? That page. we would make that <clears throat> the trigger phrase match the um, it's not just impact but impact with adverse effect or something. Or adversely affected or okay. So, I'm just gonna... Okay. Thank you. So, um, on page three in the directive on prioritizing protection of existing wetlands and the wetlands rules, there had been concern that it wasn't clear that it the 5,000 square feet is not the 5,000 square feet of the wetland, but it's 5,000 square feet of the adverse effect. <clears throat> and so that change was made on page three. So this is just a conforming technical change, page four, adding a the before adverse effects in the line. Two, down uh, at the bottom of page four, not quite at the bottom, line 14, and the minimum requirements for the wetlands rule. Again, making that change about clarifying it's 5,000 square feet of adverse effect to the wetland. I lost here. 
And then uh, when that net gain policy is supposed to be incorporated into permits, um, you push that out to mm -hmm. September 1, 2025. Until yeah. out for rollout. Okay. So um, that's the first of the dates, I think, but anyway, the flagging that we're going by. If um, it's a goal of the committee to outline a plan of work that is workable for those who have to do it. So in general, I'm just saying if someone has a concern about a date, the amount of time allocated for something, if you can flag us down as we go through, um, I want to be aware of that. Thank you. So page five are additional requirements for incorporation into the rule. Uh, going down the bottom of page five, line 19, when there's going to be an in-lieu fee compensation program that may be authorized for an adverse effect. Um, the rule will address that. The secretary may implement that in lieu of compensation program through agreements with third parties, such as the core and environmental organizations. Um, provided that any in lieu compensation shall be expended in restoration, reestablishment, enhancement, or conservation projects within the state at the HUC 8 level. And then you get to page six, line eight, the wetlands programs reports. Remember, there's now two reports one is annually about annual losses and gains. There was one change here on page seven. There was a dupl duplicative subdivision that was removed. The same substance is in subdivision three that was in subdivision five. And then on page seven, line six, this is the five year report on the comprehensive status of weapons in the state, including the NWI plus mapping project. Section five on KD is just conforming change to enforcement provision in Title 10, Chapter 47, regarding enforcement and protection of the state's waters, because you added wetlands as one of those uh, protected functions under the water quality standards. It makes sense to include wetlands here in this enforcement provision. <coughs> Moving on. Uh, uh, page 9, line 11, this is the appropriations for the wetlands <coughs> program. It had been previously 1500000 for um, kind of mapping and rollout and 500 for staff. You, because <coughs> I, believe, I believe it was Karina said that the mapping had already been satisfied, that you moved it down to 750, but it's all going to be for five new positions to implement and comply with the, the other sections in the rule, uh, sections in the act regarding weapons. So yes. let me just, oh, Karina, I missed it. Yes, um, Karina Daly for the record. Um, after further discussion um, and with taking into account the changes that we've revised um, to in collaboration with the agency, the mapping task and the reporting task have been substantially reduced. Um, and we feel that we should re revise that number to include two full-time staff positions. Uh, which would be in our current budget. 250. 250 instead of, we're doing 100, I thought we were doing 150 a head. You can do 150 a head or 124, there is no, Defined number right now. Okay. You kind of look at the skill and professional necessity for each of these positions. I think 125 to 150 is probably appropriate. Okay. I'm going to look over your shoulder to Miss Smith. Um, do you, if we're, if we're going ahead and creating these positions, do you have a recommendation as to what the default figure should be per person, per, per FTE? The default, the default number for an FTE is 150,000 okay. for the agency. All right. So then 750 becomes 300, and then five becomes two. Is that correct? Um, as proposed by Ms. Daly. So let me check in um, with Ms. Smith or anyone else from the agency who can speak to this. We're, we're changing the allocation of money and, and resource for it, and I don't know if you're <coughs> saying 
if you're comfortable with that change, or if you want to go ahead and do it, it takes more uh, staff than two. I will be honest, I am not the authority on determining FTEs um, <laughs> requested by the agency. I do agree with Karina that the original appropriation for the mapping has largely been taken care of by um, funding that the agencies acquired and continues to acquire through um, grants. I, I think that, and I don't remember the FTEs that the program has identified okay. um, for the reporting. I do think two would cover the requirements outlined in this bill. Sure. Okay. Great. So let's make the change. Um, and Mr. Brady, can you keep? Well, well, all the changes we will make as of today will be flagged in the next version, right? Highlight yes. It? Okay. Yeah. Great. So if in the next uh, 18 hours you have a conversation that changes your mind, we'll have a chance to revise again tomorrow before I go. Um, all right. So let's keep going. Thank you. Page 9, Section 7. This is uh, the requirement that DEC do the infill mapping of the River Carter base map and then to do education and outreach. This section is entirely new. The first thing you'll see is the deadline for DEC to amend the statewide River Carter base map to identify areas within municipal designated centers that are suitable for infill, and that will not cause or contribute to increases in flu loads and hazards. Then you will see an education and outreach requirement, a two-year requirement, beginning January 1, 2025, and then January 1, 2027, DEC conducts education and outreach and consult with and collect input from municipalities, businesses, and other interested parties of the public regarding how state permitting and development and map river corridors will be implemented, including potential restrictions on the use of land within map river corridors. They develop educational materials for the public. They collect input from the public. They report to you. Uh, midway through the education and outreach regarding the public input and recommendations based on the public input for changes to the requirements for state permitting and development and map river corridors. Thank you. Uh, anyone? Uh, Lauren O's, the Nature Conservancy, for the record. Um, I, I guess I have one clarifying question on the education and outreach, and that is, it looks like a two-year January, January 2025-2027 with a report due at the midway point. Is that is that accurate that we want a midway point education report out with a year so, left? So the midway point is the is there so that the General Assembly has ability to react legislatively. Um, before the rulemaking, which is January 1, 2028. So the rulemaking, pre-rulemaking probably will start right around the time of January 1, 2027, um, if not before then. It's, it's all about what you want to do with the dates and how you want to account for giving the agency time or not. I mean, you don't have to give the agency time. They'll just not meet the deadlines. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a non-ideal solution. See you later on. Right. So, um, um, one pause on the, the timeline is important. I mean, <clears throat> the committee spent a long time uh, <clears throat> doing a pretty much a complete rewrite of the EJ bill two years ago, and we're going to hear from um, the agency tomorrow. Uh, uh, Carla Remundi's coming, and we're going to be talking. So I want to make there, and then there is a phrase that came out of that work, um, and also at the Climate Council about you know, moving at the speed of trust. So we're talking about a process that's going to affect a lot of people's lives, the way they live in spaces, and how we develop. So my concern is that we build a timeline that allows for uh, adequate uh, participation all the way around, and uh, while still making timely progress because we're under pressure from increasing uh, floods uh, that seem to be um, generally more damaging year by year. I don't know if anyone from agency has any um, feedback to offer. Mr. Adams. 
Rob Evans, for the record, Rivers Program Manager in a and I'll just um, restate yep. that the agency's timeline that it provided a few weeks back is still what we're more comfortable with, just understanding it's going to take time to staff up. It's going to take time to then you know, train that staff to free up expert staff to work on this. It's going to require expert staff, not new staff. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're more comfortable with the timeline we provided a few weeks ago, which stretches this out to 2029, 2020, 2030. Um, okay, so if, we're, if we have a starting on um, January 1, 2025, uh, line four, page 10, um, this rolls out through um, well, rulemaking will. I'm trying to see when rulemaking will end. So the, the rulemaking is not, you don't see that date yeah. until page 12, mm -hmm. uh, lines 19 and 20, on the floor, January 1, 2028, they adopt the rules. Sorry, what page is that? Page 12, line 19 and 20. <laughs> Okay, so we have a three-year um, whatever engagement and outreach education, and then rulemaking itself is another engagement process. Okay, so you have some input mapping, infill mapping yeah. that starts January 1, 2026. There's no deadline for it, except that the rules for permitting development have to be adopted by January of 2028. Right. So I think, uh, Senator Watson. Thank you. Uh, there's not a provision here that uh, says when rulemaking or pre-rulemaking ought to start. Is that correct? Um, hold on a second. There might be. Uh, I have to. Well, there's two. Uh, Rebecca Piper for the Rocky Rivers Program. Um, there's two different rulemakings. There's the river corridor right. rulemaking, and then there's the rulemaking for state minimum flood hazard standards that are currently in the draft. Yeah. So it's the previous, the river corridor river rulemaking. Court, since that's one forever, yeah. So on page 29, the agency shall initiate rulemaking, including pre-rulemaking for the rules required under section nine which are the river corridor rules. And they have to initiate that on or before January 1, 2026. And that effective date needs to change. So, um, the river how long, if, if they, if they're starting on, January 2026 uh, with pre-rulemaking. How long, just one more reminder, yeah. um, how long does rulemaking typically take? If you are going to comply with the requirements of the APA, the fastest you can do it is in five and a half months. It's typically eight to nine months. And sometimes it is longer, especially when LCAR takes a long time to review. So on the long end, it's eight to nine months. I would say the long end is like 10 to 11 months. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So somewhere in the eight to 10. And that's just the long. APA. That's not pre-rulemaking. Okay. That's not, you know, drafting. So how about this? <clears throat> we use a... Uh, visual timeline to help see how these pieces were lining up, what the starts and stops were. Um, <clears throat> unless someone wants to flag a date in particular and make a suggestion, I, I suppose we leave the dates as is, draw that timeline back out and um, circulate, uh, circul um, put that on my to-do list, circulate it to people who are in today's meeting so that tomorrow we can come on and come in and see it more clearly and make adjustments if we think it's there merited. Uh, well, one day it definitely needs to change that's yeah. on page 29, line okay. eight, that effective date of the rules. That that should be 2028 underneath the timeline right now. Thank you. 
agenda. It should yeah, be it, you're right because to line up with elsewhere to line up with section nine, which is on page twelve. It should be January one, twenty twenty eight. And you do have July twenty twenty eight. Yeah. So this should be twenty twenty eight. Uh fair McDonald, and then we'll go to Mr. Kansas. <clears throat> so were this at all go smoothly according to plan that everybody did what they were supposed to do. By 2028, Vermont would be ready to implement rules to tackle 2023 type flooding. You would be ready to permit development and infill in the river corridor. Tackling, addressing yeah. the 2023 type floods. Again, you would, you're not going to prevent a flood. You're, you're going to permit the development and the infill of the mapped river corridors. In an effort to say, uh, of minimize, uh, reduce future uh, damages to people who are. If I may, I'll just add a final point to that. It's just yeah. minimizing those new encroachments that aren't regulated now. New homes going in the river corridor that are at risk, the channelization that follows to protect those homes that increases the risk. So it's, it's dealing with that kind of piecemeal development up and down the river valley to try to keep it outside of that new Andrew Bell space. Thank you, Mr. Hedden. Um, Mr. Cantley? Uh, Chris Cantley, when we commission for the record. Um, the, the only thing I would just throw out is that you're amending an existing rule. Thank you. And you're amending an existing rule that was created in the wake of Irene and subsequent events that caused substantial damage to property. And this is also a particularly violent type of flood event um, that rips the land underneath structures. Uh, and I would just urge you to move as expeditiously as you feel is possible because we've been talking about this for over a decade now and and, and the end you know, the challenge has been deferring to towns having the political and operational capacity to actually adopt these rules and then be able to administer them once they are adopted and the point of what what i've been saying in the past is that we need to regulate this at a point where it has the most effect um, in order, because this is life safety pro uh, policy. This isn't habitat. This isn't, um, this, this is about real harm being done to Vermonters. Not only is it the property that suffers the immediate harm of the stream bank or river bank erosion, but then also whatever gets carried downstream to plug a culvert, plug, plug a bridge, or flow into another dwelling. So. I guess I would just say it's up to you. I mean, I, I'm not obviously not okay tell you what to do, but no. I feel a certain sense of urgency because in our region, we also had significant flooding in 2021. Um, we had flooding in 2023, the last four Christmases, right around the Christmas season. We've had significant flooding, so that's looking more like a trend as opposed to, I mean, I have no idea why then, but in the Southeast part of the state where we're particularly flashy and have lots of uh, erodible um, river and stream corridors, this is a problem. And so I would just ask you to move as fast as you feel like is, is responsible for Vermont and Vermonters. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I would like to make a proposal about a slightly faster timeline. Um, <clears throat> so if, if rulemaking starts January 1st, 2026, and uh, rulemaking typically takes uh, the long side, um, 11 months, I, I guess I'd be more comfortable pushing back the rules effective date, uh, into 2027. Um, what's that? Versus 2028. Versus 2028. Um, and yeah, because we gotta, there's that, because I feel that sense of urgency as well. Um, yeah, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd like to at least. I would. I would like to start there. But sure. Um, yeah. Oh, it makes it if, uh, for instance, if it says begin rulemaking on or before January 1, 2026, to have an effective date of July 1, 2027, fills in a year and a half. 
that feels like even in contentious yeah. things that seems like a and when do you want the public outreach oh, and education to go on during the rulemaking if i may yeah yes, Bob Evans, if i could just project here i think that we prefer for the rulemaking to be after the education outreach because there's information we might get from that feedback that back and forth that informs how we update not just the rule, but our general permit, our mapping procedures, all of that. There's a number of things that need to be updated and fine-tuned, not just the rule. And so I hate to get you know, halfway down the rulemaking process and then we have to go backwards um, to make modifications. Generally, when having maps first, uh, public outreach starts to follow on during the mapping process, yeah. rulemaking follows on yep. that. Um, so Mr. Grady, can you help us locate in the bill when the public outreach piece begins? It's page 10, line four. Um, so the public outreach is supposed to end um, January 1st, 2027. Um, and so uh, yeah. uh, it seems to me that there's a potential to have, because the, the mapping is overlapping with the education, and so it makes sense to me to have at least even pre rulemaking start and have it overlap some um, with the education and outreach, uh, with it starting in 2026. So that's sort of in the middle. Um, so hopefully, with education starting in, in 2025, um, there'll be any, you know, hopefully, what needs to be done in terms of determining um, some of those questions for the pre-rulemaking can be done early, and then we can um, start to, uh, at least the rulemaking process can get underway, but obviously uh, it will go beyond, um, well, if, if we were to end in July of 2027, then there's even time after the uh, education and outreach is even completed. Um, so not having been involved firsthand in doing this work, if you were to have an education outreach program that ran two years and at the midpoint of it rulemaking commenced but didn't complete, does that seem workable or you would want more education and outreach time before rulemaking itself would It's hard to forecast. Right? Again, it's like we all make headway with the resources we have. That's really what it comes down to. So, um, you know, it's, we, we will shoot for whatever dates are put in front of us. Right. It's passed into law, but I just can't guarantee we'll meet those dates, you know. Yeah, um, of course. Um, so that's kind of and we we're trying to make a best faith effort to provide <clears throat> the resource to make the dates yes. um, feasible, uh, you know, for, for, for everyone's good. Um, Senator McCormick. What is the very first step in this process? So the, the mapping, uh, there's no an initiation for the mapping, but it's, it has to be done on or before January 1, 2026. And then education is going to begin January 1, 2025. So that, those two are probably kind of the, the first two things that are going to happen. And the education does not have to be does the mapping have to be done before the education, or the education have to be done before the mapping? Uh, that that the mapping and the education are ongoing requirements. They're simultaneous requirements under what's proposed. I would defer to the agency as to whether or not they can do both. And that begins this process. What? Why are we waiting till next year to begin it? Why don't we start it? 2024. Just because I don't have resources to dedicate to it. We're still in flood recovery mode and down three staff currently in the program. So it's again, it's that lag to get new staff, train them up, free up existing staff. So that's, that's just a harsh reality of all this. It's really hard to hire people right now. Yeah. yeah. You can, yeah. But to, your, to your question uh, about the mapping and the outreach, we want at least um, some set of draft maps. It wouldn't have to be statewide for every downtown and village center, but we'd want some draft maps that we could take out to do that education outreach with those. And I think some of the 
Uh, and some of the education and outreach will probably help inform the mapping process as to whether we want to, does anything need to be changed or updated? Yep. What do we consider for the infill mapping? So one will probably inform the other if they're happening concurrently. Okay. Just Chris came to the Commission. I think, I mean, I can certainly volunteer our RPC that if, it, if part of the education outreach is doing webinars, working with conservation district and other partners, and we've got the information about why a river corridor development is dangerous and why we need to uh, allow rooms of those rivers and streams to move. We can do that. Uh, we can start that process now. Um, I, I don't, I'm a little nervous to volunteer all of my colleagues, but, <laughs> but, but the information exists. We can collaborate together to put that information there. We've got information on the flood ready site. So we can harness that information so we're there. It may not say, now these are the specific maps, and these are the changes, but we can talk, talk about what the risks are. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so, oh, sorry. I, have, I have a question on the mapping. Uh, I started the conversation, I think, I said two comments and then we got into the timeline, but the mapping, as I understand it from the committee's conversation on Friday, was that you would pull that mapping language out of rulemaking and insert it into the front of the bill, as was done, but I see it in both places. Was it intentional? And if so, just to understand that, if it wasn't intentional, I want to flag that the language around the mapping has some changes. So the language at the top of the bill, page 9, line 20, where it starts, is different from uh, what the committee had agreed to to changes in the mapping language in the past. So I'm flagging that the mapping is in two places and is worded differently. And what's the second location? The second location where the mapping shows up is in rulemaking on Anybody find it before me, please? Is it 29? Yeah, it's 27. Page 13, lines 19, and page 14. Oh. Page 13, line 19. <clears throat> so if the intent was to pull it out of rulemaking, the language that the committee had agreed to and that several of us have testified in support of, was the language that's currently on page 13, line 19? Um, so we would just like to see that if it's pulled out of rulemaking, that be the language that's carried out to page 9 and line 20. The agency would prefer that it not be in rulemaking. Our existing rule yeah. points to our mapping procedure, yeah. which is signed by our commissioner. So we would embed all that in our procedure. Right. But I don't think it's necessary to do the infill mapping by way of rulemaking, mm -hmm. rulemaking authority. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, eight left. Um, but the language on section B9 uh, about areas within municipal designated centers that are suitable for infill, I believe that came from the discussion on Friday about needing infill mapping. Um, I don't know if the language on page 13 going on to 14 is the same in the agency's perspective or not, I will do whatever the committee wants me to do. <laughs> that section is kind of more tied to like, just the authority to regulate those areas, less than kind of the mapping itself. I and mean, it's tied to the mapping, obviously, but um, I think that language still makes sense. <laughs> the language I believe the language that's currently in page 9, line 20, was from the original bill. <laughs> that has since been amended several times over into what is now page 13, line 19. Okay. So ma mapping by procedure is more flexible, um, and there's an education and outreach program going along with it. Um, that's a clear concern we've been 
articulating, then um, can you just say a little bit about, <clears throat> if someone said, well, um, are you, will the procedure guarantee public <clears throat> process? Um, can you just comment on the public process piece of procedure? Yeah, I haven't looked in depth at our procedure, but we walk through notification of towns yep. and district commissions, and we publish draft maps for comment before we put them official. So that's all laid out currently in our mapping procedure, and would stay. We might fine tune it, of course, but it's very. Okay, so if that makes uh, then section 70 in line 2021, that we don't need to specify it as a rule. Um, I just want to make sure that we have coherent language that triggers it as a procedure later. And required rulemaking content, the rule shall, and it marches through. And again, if helpful, I can send a specific text from the rule right now that links the mapping to our procedure. It's, it's codified in rule content. So there's a <coughs> linkage that exists. So we still have the rulemaking, and line four of page 13 says, here's what the rules address. But then in <clears throat> sub five, line 19, it says a process. Yes. So that's the flexibility pivot there. Like it's a rulemaking that specifies a process, but yeah. Yeah. Um, then the process is you administer it under your current procedure. Yeah, I take that as a directive to amend our mapping procedure accordingly. Okay. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but I don't know if it makes sense to others. Okay. Um, and I don't know if the language on section seven okay. is what the others want. Right, so then we have to, um, cool. I understand that the change, and I just want to kind of make sure that we keep the, all the gears meshing together. Ms. Smith, you had your hand up. I, to emphasize Rob's point, the agency has the directive to move forward with the mapping. It will, we will move more, we'll be able to move more quickly if it's not tied to the rulemaking. But there is a distinction in the language um, on page nine, going on to top of page 10, it talks about mapping areas within municipal designated centers. And on the top of 14, it talks about areas within existing settlements mm. suitable for development. And I assume there was a reason for that distinction. Um, the other piece on line 13, on page 13, is the collaboration with RPCs, which again, I think could be part of the process, doesn't have to be tied to rulemaking. Um, but I would suggest that in that language that begins on page nine, we just clarify whether we're talking about designated centers or existing settlements and add the piece on collaboration with our partner organizations. I think existing settlements was desired by partners because it's more expansive than just those mapped designated centers. It's kind of developed a footprint. I think, I think most agree with the existing settlements being <clears throat> focused on. Okay. And So I'm, it's strictly to edit in two different places at the same time. Um, but the existing set, right, I think we talked about the broader language, existing settlement, right, intentionally. So I, it's on the top of page 14. So, okay. I think it's kind of just a little bit the bottom of page 13, top of page 14. Taking that section and essentially moving it out of rulemaking, moving it up to page nine, ten, in where there's the other conversation already around at the beginning. Uh, page ten, line four, no, page nine, nine twenty. <coughs> so I'm just like amending it onto that section. But do you want the rules to include a process for amending the maps going into the future? We're comfortable with that. That's right. Yeah. So that would mean it's in both places? No, I think basically you move, as was just said, the language from 13 to 14 to 9 to 10. Yeah. And then you refine the language on 13 to 14 that the rules will include a process for amending 
future statewide river corridor base maps to identify, I just would just say amending river for future amendment of river corridor base maps. That all sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you build the process, the ongoing process you'll use over the years mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to the rules. And then as Hannah suggested, that coordination or collaboration with ACCD and the Regional Planning Commission will be moved the page nine and ten as well. Great. So let's do that, and and then of course we'll see it highlighted in the next draft, so we can see if we got all the stars in alignment. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You still haven't decided the timeline. Sooner the better. To send yes. All right. So uh, Senator Watson had a suggestion that came up on page. 29 that rules are uh, completed. Uh, it gives a 18 month window, right? January 126 through July 127. Um, that, that's, I don't know why we have 28. That's a two and a half year um, timeline, which seems uh, longer than I've ever seen before, I'm sure, like me, but- uh, I was just following my notes from Friday. I don't know, I don't, I'm not blame, I'm blame, there's no blame. This is just trying to make sure that we've kept uh, all the adjustments in mind. So I, I think the Senator Watson's suggestion about 2027 there. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Yeah. So mapping is going to be done on January 1, 2026, correct? Is that okay? Yeah. All right, and then on page 10, when does education announce? 25. January 1, 2025, yeah. mm -hmm. and it ends January 1, 2027. Yep. Okay, then moving on to page 12, when will rules be required to be adopted? July, July, 20, July the 27th. Which is really only six months faster than what's here. Yeah. And then, since we don't have to skip 20 pages in the future, when do you want that pre rulemaking to start? At the same time. I education outreach. I would think, uh, I, I don't know if we need that. <coughs> That's a, well, I think it's helpful to specify a start date, um, but I also feel like agencies will know as they're doing their work when they want to get started. Okay, so you're not going to have, because I defer to the chair's preference to always have a start I by know. and end by date. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're not going to have a start by date. Well, so let me check in with Mr. Evans, whose so shop will be most in charge of education outreach, right? What is if you were for clarity in the bill to say when these different activities begin, what would you uh, recommend as a start date on the education outreach? Oh, I think what you have in the bill now is workable in terms of the time frame. And, and if we have partners that are helping us, absolutely. And I know we at least have a few, so we can get started that soon for sure. How long it takes to do it justice, we will see. So let's leave the date as it's for start. For the start date. Yeah. So that's 26. Okay. And then on page 13. Knowing that uh, RPCs might voluntarily begin the work. Actually, it's, it's page 15. When do you want the permit requirement to commence? Right now it's July 1, 2028. That was six months from the previous rulemaking deadline. Okay. So do you want it to be January 1, 2028? Right, that would be six months after. So yeah, like, that would sync up six months following the end of rulemaking. Yes. Senator McCormick. Just so I can sleep just for it. <laughs> the people who will actually have to do this, the people with the feet on the ground, are of the opinion that we can't start it any earlier or finish it any earlier than it's being. We're concerned at this point. Let's put it that way. Just knowing the, the lag time it takes to staff up and train on it. 
a concern meeting these. But again, you'll shoot for them if that's what ends up coming. The worst bosses I ever had were the ones who tell you something they want to done and just say, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and if I was like, no, go back, just do it. So yeah. you can't do that. You are saying that this is the schedule we have. No. Be realistic. Yeah. Um, on the three open positions, so those are, this is under current authorization. It's just you don't have people to fill slots. So we're starting a little bit in the hole, is yes. what I'm learning. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll just say from our hiring perspective, we used to get 50 applications. We now get four, and mm. two of them are qualified. Mm. Right? And I'm like, that's, that's the nature of. Mm. Hiring right now. Okay. We often have to go out and repost again. Yep. So we'll not interview folks and it's like, oh, they're not a good fit. We need to see if we can. Right. So it takes time. Yeah, currently. I would say everyone's trying to make a best faith effort to go as quickly as possible without causing um, problems for those who have to do the work itself. So we also are going to have legislative sessions each year in between. There's a report coming back. We'll have conversations. But I think I would just want this committee to stay aware of how things are going and that we make adjustments as necessary to um, make speed, um, and but do it well. OK. And just uh, to make a comment, it's not that there won't be any out outreach and education around River Quarters between now and this beginning of the outreach session because we are currently working with regional planning commissions to do <clears throat> outreach to towns on River Quarter and floodplain bylaws. So we're having that conversation. It's mostly focused on municipalities and like planning planning commissions, like decision making bodies. But there is there is some of that kind of pre work going on. So it won't be starting totally from scratch at that time so so do you want to work uh work, based on the conversation discussion decisions made where do you want to uh, resume like uh page 13 yeah and the required rule making content uh, one of the things you wanted to specify is that the rules for river corridor development will provide for exemptions from permitting or use of general permits for certain development. The agency already has general permit authority on page 14. This is just going to, uh, and you'll see on page 14 that it specifies that the general permits don't have to be implemented by rule. But what you will be doing on, on page 13 in the rulemaking is when they can be issued for what type of development will um, I mean, the river court rules already do that. Right. Uh, so you're just basically duplicating that kind of how they're going to do it. Okay. Sir Watson? Just to clarify, so this is like the, the part where we say it's okay to... It's okay to do the general permits. Right. And what are you going to do the general permits for? When you actually issue the general permit, you don't do it by rule. I have a quick question on, because we have existing rulemaking authority for muni for things that are exempt from municipal regulation, does that need to be maintained in the language of this bill until a new rule of some sort goes into place? Because right now it's struck. And I'm, you, I'm not you, being a lawyer. You, if you have a, there's a transition section later on that says until you adopt these rules and are permitting that you operate under the old rules. Okay. Keep reading. Um, page 13, line 19, you're going to amend that. It's no longer going to be as detailed. It's just going to set forth the process um, for amending the state library of charter maps. Uh, page 14, lines 14 through 16, we just talked about how the agency will not have to go to rulemaking to issue a general permit. Page 15, line 7, in the Permitting requirement, you're moving that date from July 1, 2028 to January 1, 2028. Um, it's no longer about when the municipality has adopted the plot 
photo hazard area bylaw or not. Um, and then you can go to page 17, section 10. We're moving out of river quarters. We're moving into state flood hazard area. Um, before we go, <laughs> let me go. Uh, two things. This is a question for anybody in the room with a Juris Doctor, of which I am not. Uh, page 15, line 7, the permit requirements section. My read of this is now that it says development in a flood hazard area or mapped river corridor, mm -hmm. that that would have the unintended like leave consequence of saying that the new expanded rule would be for the floodplain as well and not just for the river corridor, which this committee has agreed to. So I, I think I think that you'd want to strike flood hazard area and have this just be the permit requirement for the map for river corridor as I need it. Correct. And I think going back to what Rebecca called out, there might be some additional wordsmithing aid because the municipally exempt activities for river corridors and flood hazard areas, that needs to main, be maintained as is going right. forward. And we're adding to that right. development broadly um, right. in that river corridors. So there's going to still be state regulation of flood hazard areas for those activities the towns are allowed to regulate. So there's some structural changes we need to make in the text, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah the, um, the, this language right now that we're talking about on page 15, line seven, and also the language on um, beginning page 12, line 20, it does still refer to development within a flood hazard area or map river corridor. So the way the bill is written now, the committee is asking a and R to take over statewide regulation of both of those pieces beginning January 1st, 2028. I don't know if that's the intention. If not, then flood hazard area should be struck from both of those lines. Well, I think what we ended up doing was saying that the standards would get developed and uh, <coughs> that the study committee would address whether or not the state should then take over implementing. So the one on 12, um, what, what, sorry, Ms. Smith, where were you? I'm, I'm trying to look for. It's really on the, the heading on page yep. 12, oh. line nine. Yep. And then on page 12, going on to page 13, okay. uh, line two. So it would be striking map river, sorry. So striking you, flood hazard area out of that head? You, you have a lot of decisions to be made yep. with regard to what you're going to permit through A&R and what you're going to permit through municipalities. Um, because you're going to come to some conforming sections later on yep. where I'm not sure what you want to do. Okay. And so it was great. So, this is just the beginning of that. Like, what do you really want to do? So um, we were <coughs> supporting the st statewide flood hazard area uh, standard bylaws, but not pushing the question as to whether or not they were going to be implemented into the study group. So in terms of like the rulemaking, et, et cetera, we wouldn't want to inadvertently specify that the state, the decision's already been made and that they're obligated to implement. Okay. So that means you change to the head, uh, line nine, page 12, right? Yeah. Okay. So just walking through what you're going to change, page 12, line nine, you're going to change the header of that section. Yep. No longer reference flood hazard areas. Page 12, line 19, you're changing the date from January 1 to July 1, from 2028 to 2027. Yep. You are on page 13, line 2, striking reference to a flood hazard area. Bottom of page 13, you're changing the process language for amending river quarter maps in the future. Good question. Shannon Watson. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just want to check before we leave uh, this section because this this is existing. Uh, 
law. We're, we're, we're amending existing law. And so does, I think my question is, do we, Actually, I think I'm going to hold off on my question because I think it's really just it's wrapped up in whether or not we have a statewide oh, minimum standard. Minimum standard, and I yeah. Okay, I'm I'm worried that if we well, I'm going to hold off on my question. Okay, never mind. Sorry. I have a, a quick question. Maybe on the header, so page twelve, line nine, with the header, because it's an existing rule, and we will still need to maintain regulation of flood hazard areas for the employees and users. Should we still keep flood hazard areas in that line? To no, we're, it, we're gonna we're gonna deal with that through a transition clause. You're gonna you're you're gonna amend the section like right away, but then in transition you're gonna say you're gonna retain that authority over municipally exempt, and then later on, in where you're doing where you're doing um, the state flood hazard area standards. I think you might want to include language there that you're going to regulate the yeah the municipally exempt. Thank you for channeling my question. That's why I was thinking that you were going there yeah. because because <clears throat> we will still well. I, don't know. I get it. I think the transition section is yeah. going to be important. But it's probably not sufficient right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and can you remind me again? Sorry. Uh, the date you have on line 20, uh, page 12, is amended to what? Uh, it's July 1, yeah. 2027. Yeah, okay. There is another change on page 13, in line 13 okay. to 18, where it's referencing the requirements and process for a municipality to be delegated. They're only gonna be delegated in development in a map or recorder, and not in a flood hazard area. So that will change there as well. Okay. Two Lines changes. 14, 15. Yeah. yeah, 14 and 15 and then 16. <clears throat> Do you, um, under page 13, line 9, then um, do if we're going to be dealing with flood hazard areas and transition language, does is that matter that that's in there? Yeah, probably Or the quarter standards would not be tied into requirements for the yeah. impacting? Sorry, what line were you on there? Sorry, nine. line nine of page 13, it's uh, B2, B designed to ensure the state and municipalities make community and affiliate firms for the impact yep. it's, it's, it's lines five through 10, really. Because five right. through eight is NFIP as well. Because you're just focused on the state river corridor. Do you do you want development and river corridors to be subject to the NFIP regulatory obligations? Well, they're different regulations and standards. So, if they're in map flood hazard areas, they will already be subject to units like municipally regulated flood hazard like flood hazard area rules. Okay. It would be under the state's jurisdiction, it would be under the municipal jurisdiction. Okay. Okay. Because we would only be looking at through a state permit river corridors, which have different types of standards than you know, flood hazard areas. Right. Is uh FEMA sort of blind to river corridor regulations? Yes. yes. Yeah. They have language and statute <clears throat> that acknowledges erosion, but right. there's no standards that are tied to it. And there's no insurance that, like, no insurance requirements tied that to the Yeah. It's only in the map of insurance. Okay. Thank you. And I think on page 14, line 4 and 5, you have the strike reference and line 8, strike reference to NFIP. Don't. Right. 
right. Yeah, I'm losing words. If you go to the statewide, state, <laughs> state hazard <laughs> area standards, yes. Then we have to do this. If we don't, so if you don't, then, then we would keep it. Right. Okay. So we should take it out. You know, until there's a decision to add it in. It's, you know, evaluated in the future, like the study can review all my recommendation. And so later in the bill, we do not set forward a state standard as it's written. No, you do. Yeah, so that's do, where but we Because municipalities might adopt it voluntarily, right? They could step up, right? But this wouldn't say that you must step up. I guess I I'm now confused. I think so. Well, there's two things. <clears throat> as I understand it, as I read it, that there's language to create a statewide minimum flood hazard standard that municipalities adopt. Yes. So there's like a bottom level for yes. municipalities for their participation, which I see that going forward. There's language around creating a study committee to look at statewide regulation of flood hazard areas and how that would look. And that recommendations coming out of that would include um, legislative su like um, suggestions and for statute change. So it's kind of the question of there's a statewide minimum floodplain standards for municipalities. Do we as a state regulate floodplains in any way and make recommendations with statute suggestions? Um, and as it was before we're making these changes, it's basically saying essentially like we would be regulating flood hazard areas coming out of the study committee. And, but I don't think that that's the intent. I think the intent is that the com it's more open. commission yeah. or the, the study committee would make recommendations and from that you would decide which, where do we go? So, so Mr. Chair, um, I have compromised on not do, going further than we, because of the administration's perspective on this and the inability to fully staff it to meet the needs yeah. is basically where I, have landed because what I heard is we would have to hire 15 to 20 folks to actually implement what we had originally discussed. And I am leaning towards the study committee being more focused on how would we do this. Um, so it seems like that's what we are debating is whether or not we want it to be more open and have the study committee potentially come back and say, actually, we don't think it should be state level or not done exclusively by municipalities. But for me, I do think that that's the question, and I'd like them to explore that sure. rather than keep it as is. Right, like, is it, right. And, and maybe it's even a more nuanced question of should it be done regionally versus should it be done at the state level? Or should it be supported at the state level, but you know, whatever the right authority is leveraged to RPCs versus the state. So. <laughs> I don't know what that means for the language, well, but... So when we complete the study committee, and let's... But don't we need to make a decision on this, and that would inform the study committee? Um, if I understood Ms. Pfeiffer's point. Is if, if this is assumed, the way this language is written is it's assuming my perspective rather than what the administration has advocated for, which is a more open-ended question. You mean so, unresolved? Yeah, or like a less leading, I don't know how to put that, a, a less directed, well, if the, I'm understanding the concern. The, this is based on the rivers behaving a certain way, and they are directing <laughs> the, the maps. And now we're going to, once you have the maps, um, and the state says you ought to do one thing, and the municipalities say, say, no, we don't want to do that. Where's the tiebreaker? Mm. Where is the tiebreaker? Yeah, and if you don't have a tiebreaker, this is all talk. Yeah. Well, what's the tiebreaker? That's the question. I, I think. <clears throat> To Senator White's point, I think um, if the assumption of the committee and of the legislation is that there will be some other authority regulating flood hazard areas besides municipalities, yes. whether it's a mix or a blend or some other recommendation, then we probably would leave all these references that we've been striking to the National Flood Insurance Program in yes. because there would be some assumption of some sort of state rule or program that would, <laughs> that would um, come back 
into some rulemaking, almost like the flood hazard areas would catch up to the river quarter through rulemaking. Like river quarters are going forward. We have a study committee to talk about floodplains and then they catch up. Yeah. That's kind of the way I've been thinking, or they're totally separated and yeah. done on different. That's that's really not how the bill's set up oh, right okay. now. Right now, the agency has to adopt um, required state flood hazard area standards for development in flood hazard areas by January 1. No, actually, they have, yeah. They have, January 1, 2026. And then all municipalities that implement an NFIP program have to adopt those statewide <coughs> standards by January 1, 2028. I think the 2026 date, as I read it, was for the statewide minimum standard for municipalities. Right. Right. And then you have the study commission that's going right. concurrently with that. Right. And then the study committee would come out with some sort of a. But that's a future legislative right. decision. Yes. Okay. The yep. legislation doesn't need to address that right now. If they want to change it into like A and R is regulating it all, that's future. Yeah. What you're doing here in this bill is A and R's got a minimum standards. Municipalities and NFIP have to adopt that minimum standard. So you're not going to municipalities and like, oh you don't this municipality is this and that but not that, etc. What you need in that language on page 17 going on to page 18 is that the rules will address how development except for municipal regulation will be written. Oh, okay. Right. That's, yeah. On page 18, it says on page 17, I read that as the statewide minimum floodplain standard for municipalities. I, th I think what Mike is the state would have to, this would have to be amended to include our regulation of areas except for municipal regulation. So we'd be pulling the language that's currently in 754, putting it in 755, right. saying we're adopting a statewide minimum flood hazard area standard. Right. It's implemented by the state in areas exempt from municipal regulation and implemented by municipalities who participate in NFIP everywhere else. Right. Yes. And. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chair, so there was also a conversation about places that the state does currently regulate in those areas that are special. I can't remember exactly all the different categories that you State, yeah. state buildings, Small. agriculture, silviculture, and energy projects that go through the Public Utility okay. Commission. Yeah. Towns can't regulate, so we do currently. <clears throat> okay, so we're not setting ourselves up for some strange system. All I would say is we need to maintain that um, as long as towns can't regulate it because the state would be out of compliance with the NFIP if we don't. Okay. State, can the state regulate that either? No, yeah, they do. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to make sure that if we're putting this in, we're not somehow then. Right. All right. So um, that helpful mm -hmm. clarification about. Page 17. We don't need to insert. <laughs> preload the language in that it will be part of a, a coherent statutory change in a future legislature. Not, we don't need to like stub it in there, maybe we're going to oh. do it. Okay, so yeah. Senator Watson. Uh, thank you. So I just want to check uh, with the state books about capacity. Um, well, section. Well, yeah, well so because I'm, I'm taking that we're on page 17 now. I was kind of holding off <laughs> on this question. Actually, I'm going to you. Sorry. sorry. I keep saying I have a two points. I get to run and then I start on mm -hmm. all. Well, oh, I'm sorry. But before we get into flood plans, I have two more comments on the report. And I'll say them quickly and I'll say them in order before I forget. Uh, the first, I do want to flag on page 13. Line 11, this exemption from permitting use of journal general permits for certain development feels really vague. Um, you know, what, what would class, what would clarify, or what would be classified as certain development that would then get an exemption? It feels like a, a space for significant loopholes for development. Um, I'm happy to look at that more, but just seeing that I, it is applied for concern for me. 
And the other question is starting on page 15, line, 19, or line 18, the delegation section. As I understand it, the, there was a recommendation that municipalities who want to opt in to the new river corridor permit program, they could be the issuing, they could issue or have issuing authority. This first one though says, secretary may delegate to another state agency the authority to implement these rules. I don't know that I've ever seen secretary to state agency to state agency delegation. I don't know if that was supposed to mean the municipality or no, it was supposed to mean it was you know, post irene legislation mm -hmm. since we were regulating things that implicated other state agencies. The idea is we could delegate some or all of our authority to VTRANS to regulate their infrastructure, or delegate some or all of it to the agency of AG. We talked to them about it. We said, we're ready to talk if you're interested. Um, and you show us you have the capacity to do it. They've never raised their hand. So that just sits idle in there. It's, 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 uh, they could raise their hand any time, though. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. And I, I think to your point on page 14, starting on line 14, 15, 16, about the, oh no, sorry, wrong one. Uh, line thir or page 13, line 11, about the exemptions. We currently have exemptions in our rules, so that's established by rulemaking. But, and, and as, I don't know where that language right? came from. Can someone explain why, what yeah. the, the exemptions Question would be, I mean, what would be an example? Why would we I'll hazard a guess? I think it's a, just the desire for some flexibility around certain types of development. Yeah, that's I, fair. And I don't, yeah. I don't know if that language is either helpful or harmful. I mean, I think exemptions is a touchy thing. The way we add flexibility through our general permit is we, for, as I showed or shared with you previously, you know, we have low risk things we'll put in a non reporting category. Right. We might be able to add some development into the non-reporting category. The other thing we have, like for linear development, for power and transportation, knowing that those have to crisscross floodplains and streams all the time, <coughs> is we have an escape hatch in, in our rule that they demonstrate there's no practicable alternative. And they have to walk through and demonstrate, like, we need to do this. This is critical infrastructure. It has to be here. We've explored all of alternatives. We might need to do something for that from at river corridors. I think about people that are in the river corridor now and they need to replace their septic system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe they need to put the mound a little closer to the river because there's nowhere else to put it. We can work that kind of language into the general permit. Yeah. So. Yeah, our current exemptions are like um, maintenance of existing structures. Like you don't need to yeah. come to us to get a permit if you're maintaining your structure without a change to the footprint. Like maintenance uh, um, of like roads, like repaving roads. But if you start to change dimensions or add fill or anything like that, then, then all of a sudden now you're triggering permit requirements. Okay. So the exemptions that are in the rule right now are removal of the structure, or removal of any other improvement to property in whole or in part, so long as the ground elevation is under and adjacent to the removed structure or improvement remain unchanged. The next is maintenance or repair, the development in the usual course of business, does not include substantial improvements to structures. The next is repair, replacement, maintenance, or reconstruction of transportation and utility networks, provided that they're approximately the same vertical and horizontal dimensions, shall include repaving of transportation networks. Um, and then there are further exceptions. So um, there are exemptions. There are exemptions under the current rule. So how about if we split then? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chair Ray, um, Mason Overstreet, staff attorney with the Conservation Law Foundation for the record. Our recommended language on this, so Senator Watson raised this issue last week in regards to the exemptions. The language that we're looking at on page 13, line 11. This is just basically directing the rule in the rulemaking process. And Mr. O'Grady's point and Mr. Evans' point, our suggested language would be to say something along the lines of provide for certain regulatory exemptions under the rule, and the rule will be singular now versus plural, involving minor development activities with no adverse environmental effects. That would provide enough narrow direction basically for the rule so as folks couldn't use it as a loophole exempted. and or say that this committee and or other folks during the legislative process were looking for larger exemptions, right? 
I say we captured and meet that objective through the non-reporting category. You know, farmers out there plowing his field, he doesn't need a permit. He wants to build a barn, he needs a permit. Um, yes, I think the language that you suggested is in line with what we had. And I would imagine it's not okay. okay. So if that's a little more specific and it doesn't give the agency any difficulty for managing, then can you either read that aloud or again, or like you want to read it, it, not send not it to Mr. Green <laughs> for further possible revision by our council? Yes. Okay. So let's do that. I'm going to put M O right next to that <laughs> email. Thank you. It's worth stating that through the, the education outreach process, that might you know enlighten us in terms of exemptions, not reporting activities, things like that. So I think that we we're migrating to section 10 on page 7, unless council has questions based on a discussion. Sure. Um, so this is the requirement that on a report January 1, 2026, ANR adopt rules that establish a set of flood hazard area standards that all municipalities enrolled in NFIP that are required to adopt and administer. They shall contain standards that exceed the minimum of the NFIP by reducing, reducing flood risk to new development and ensuring new development does not create adverse impacts to adjacent pre existing development. And any municipality with a municipal flood hazard area bylaw or ordinance shall update their bylaw to incorporate the sub state flood hazard area standards and nothing shall prohibit a municipality from adopting a more <laughs> protective flood hazard standard with language and standards approved by the agency. And then on page 18, any municipality participating in NFIP shall update their standards to comply with the state flood hazard area standards by January 1, 2028. If they do not, then the state flood hazard area standards shall become the applicable standards for regulating development in any flood hazard area. Question here, who does that permitting? Um, so it's not clear. I think for, from part of where that language came from is in our office, so we have new maps coming out from FEMA Towns have to have a, um, an updated flood hazard bylaw on the date the maps come out. Otherwise, they're immediately suspended from the program. So no one can buy flood, new policies of flood insurance and old ones can't be renewed. And so our concern is for towns that don't have the capacity or where we don't have a ton of capacity to do those bylaw updates, that this could almost be like a trigger that goes into effect where they would have and I don't know like we where the RPCs would think of this, but we have concerns of some regions like not being able to get all their towns updated by the time the maps come out. And that we would have like mass suspension of many towns. No, I mean and obviously we have no us the towns still have to adopt it. We have no ability to say, town, you will do this and uh, select boards to actually be able to do that. So there's that challenge. So so we yes. can work with our towns to encourage them to do that. The, the other kind of just while I've got the um, the other concern I have about establishing a standard and requiring all towns adopted by said date is I, I absolutely appreciate the theory and it should make outreach and education easier. But the fundamental problem is can they implement any flood hazard bylaw that they have? Are they tracking development that's occurring in the flood plan? Are they evaluating the value of those properties? I mean, all the stuff that you, I used to do this as, as a zoning officer in Maryland. It's complicated. Um, and so my concern is, it's almost like saying, we understand you're having difficulty driving your Toyota Camry, so here's a Lamborghini, which hopefully you'll have better luck with that. Um, so that's, that's my, my concern. So I, do what you want, but my, my recommendation would be, unless this, this messes up with the flood map would be roll that into the study 
like is that part of the solution of having what what does that actually get you by actually having towns update the same standard because they all still have to meet the minimum NFIP requirements right yeah and I, from our perspective there's two pieces to it so one is that we're doing this mass file update so it does allow for some level of ease of adoption mm -hmm. Understanding that study is still happening concurrently, that would come with some recommendations at the end of what do we look at for like a state versus municipal breakdown of regulation. So like one doesn't exclude the other. The other piece is my staff, we're down two positions and we have, like I said, every time we interact with a town or a developer, or someone calls us to ask us what the, every single interaction starts with opening up that town's <laughs> bylaw because every single town is different. Yes. And it allows us some level of um, efficiency to be able to say, well, we know you have to start here. You may have a handful of towns that exceed that, but those will likely be less than every single town being different and so it allows us to be able to provide tools and support and efficiency on our staff's end. Uniform reminder. Yeah, yeah. Um, Senator Watson. So if we adopt a statewide minimum standard, does that increase your capacity or does that decrease your capacity? I think it increases our capacity because we're already doing the bylaw work that's required by FEMA, so that's already staff effort being spent. Um, by having a statewide minimum standard, I think then it allows us to standardize how we approach towns. And, and I think the study committee may look at, like I, I think to Chris's point, or Mr. Cameron's point, it's a good one, of like, is, does this become too sophisticated? Is this harder for towns? I think the lens of like a no adverse impact standard allows for some, in that transition period, some level of higher assurance of, of reducing risk to new development or rebuilding development. And I think that it would allow, there may be some more complexities, but it wouldn't be just like wholesale, you can fill if you want to, you can put new houses wherever you want to. So it allows some sideboards while a study committee would go forward to say what, we, what is a breakdown or, or an approach to a statewide rule or, or development. Is the statewide rule enough of an improvement for many municipalities that they'll get lower insurance rates from NFIP? Um, not on its face alone. There's FEMA has a community rating system, the CRS, which can help to provide some discounts to flood insurance, but it requires municipalities to enroll in that program, which is a very big effort, and it requires ongoing administrative work to maintain that participation. We have talked with FEMA before about almost like a, like just by the fact that our state has higher standards, you know, do towns right. automatically get enrolled? They haven't allowed for that to happen. They're, they're right now exploring changes that you know, that happen. I was just trying to think of incentives that might, so it's less of a regulatory <coughs> push and more of an incentive to move. Mr. Campany. One last, I guess my point, my primary point is just, I don't know that a, having a consistent statewide standard and having towns adopt it i don't think it's necessarily to solve the problem so that part of getting it was part of addressing what like, the technical issues and the fema map update that's fine but if, that, if the if the suggestion that wouldn't i don't think this is rebecca's or uh, but just putting this out there it i don't know that that is unto itself going to solve the problem of municipal capacity to do that work so uh right <coughs> increasing the standardized test standard that's still not going to help you learn more, <laughs> right so that's so that's the that's the concern so if you're looking if you're approaching from the standpoint of efficacy of the new fema flood map rollouts and town with the tech that that makes sense but as far as like to the extent this will ultimately solve the outcome of regulation of development floodplains and that is not going to probably in my in my estimation that's probably not going to be the outcome i don't disagree yeah. Well, and it's a step. Yeah. So before we created a study committee, I think we had already <clears throat> kind of made the decision that to address that capacity issue. I know it involved a lot of staff, but that yeah. moving into the state then addressed the you have a better standard, but can you implement the question? And as as part of the committee's effort to like take some pressure off the staffing demands. We're trying to find some sort of intermediate pathway that lets us 
maybe defer that decision without leaving ourselves in that awkward place. I can see how the 2028 thing, if we haven't changed the landscape uh, capacity wise, won't necessarily get what everyone wants. So, just to remind you, just the same Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, deferring decisions by definition leaves us in awkward places. And when I asked earlier what the tiebreaker is, if you don't know what the tiebreaker is, then things are ripe for appeal because the tiebreaking decision is sort of un unknown and been left for a later decision. <clears throat> you got a tiebreaker in here. They haven't adopted the state hazard areas by July of 2028, then that becomes a default. You just need to clarify who's going to be the, the, the permitter. But you have Mr. Campion's concern that the municipalities aren't suitable for that. And, and maybe you need to adopt the statewide standard, but not make it mandatory, but have the state study committee recommend how to implement that standard, whether or not it's through a state system right. or through municipal system. <clears throat> so thank you, because that was headed where I was trying to go, which is finance committee, of which we have three members, is trying to deal with how you permit solar projects or, or uh, communications towers. And the object, there's an objection when people, citizens of the town, come in to appeal the application to, for a solar project. And what we're learning in that committee is that's not the time. The time to appeal is when the town plan or zoning is being written. That's what you appeal. You don't wait until it's been written and someone makes an application that conforms to the zoning and it turns out to be in what most people would say was an abominable place. You're appealing the wrong thing. Mark, does it make any sense here? Yes. So if we don't, if we allow towns or encourage towns to make their own decisions, the the time for the citizens to wear in, weigh in is when those decisions are being formulated to adopt the plan. And people don't show up for that. They show up for the application. Which is too late. I think Warren had something she wanted to say. Oh, I think I was just going to, to agree with what Mr. Campany and then Mr. O'Grady would characterize, which was like if you're going to create a study committee to look at the National Fund Insurance Program and how to better protect Vermonters in the floodplain and future development, it might make sense to fold all of this into a broad and scope study to say, like, <coughs> what are the opportunities with the state? What are the opportunities with the town? how do we create something that is both durable and actionable? And at what level of government do those things take place? And, and FEMA's plans were born and grew in the inundation floods of the Midwest. And to say, we'll just follow FEMA is paddling up the wrong stream. Um, they, they're, they're tying ourselves to planning that doesn't fit our topography is perilous. So, but that's what we're considered doing. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to keep the, the minimum standard language in here. And I actually do disagree with the idea of having it be in the study rather than implementing now. And I understand the perspective. I really do. And I'm <laughs> typically the person in this committee going, don't burn in the towns. <laughs> um, that's like my a rally call. Um, however, I do not believe, based on the testimony we've heard from the administration, that this is something that would be a burden to towns beyond, I mean, it. I think the support that they would get from the administration would actually be better than what they're receiving now and would make it easier for them to actually do the minimum standard versus now where they aren't getting the technical support. I think it would then kind of move us in the direction of potentially having a different regulatory framework with the uh, regional planning commission or the state taking it over rather than 
having individual towns have their own individual ways of doing it. So I am in favor of keeping this language. I am concerned we are running out of time on this conversation. And I, I just think this is a decision, not a debate at this point, is we have to decide do we want a minimum standard or do we not want a minimum standard. And we are not going to have everyone agree on it. And I personally would vote to keep this language in and not roll it into the study committee. So um, I'm flagging this as an open question. OK, never mind. <laughs> and, let's, and we'll facilitate, we'll, my grandma would say, sleep on it. It will be clear in the morning. Uh, but let's leave that section un unaltered. So that Where, then, can I give you one quick footnote? Just to, yes. So I have not, I have not had a chance having to digest S310 which is in uh, oh, yeah. Senate Government Ops. But apparently there's language in there also about <coughs> standard flow. So anyway, just whatever you guys decide, just a flag. You probably already know this, so just a heads up, you may want to make sure that whatever you guys, that it all, that it all is working together. So. Yeah, I think 310 is with um, yeah. building codes, right? Mm. No, 310 is our bill, I oh, believe, okay. in Senate Gov Ops. So, okay, state yeah. response to flood um, emergencies. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it would relate to that yet, but I yeah. so we have the same language around building standard, like building codes. Mm -hmm. Better general things. I'll like just, just, I'll just okay. give it a heads up. Thank just you. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Well, so, Senator Watson, I serve on Gov Ops in the afternoon, so we will keep that in mind. I hope it is that, uh, and I've talked to the chair as well as we have two people on the committee, but we do complimentary pieces and don't thoughtfully complimentary and don't overwrite mm -hmm. each other's work or leave a gap. Um, so, okay. Well, if that's an open question, then a lot of other then the next be 20 pages or 10, <laughs> yeah, 11 is. pages are open questions as well. You can skip to dams because the study committee, if you, you don't know what's going to be in the study committee. Um, and you don't know what needs to be conforming in the municipal authority and zoning bylaws. So you can just skip the dance. Um, Page 30. Okay, so let's do that. And Those really the are... first change there is page 36. Can I undo what we're just doing here for a moment? Can you just... For, for the section that we're now going to pass over, there are some grade uh, lines. Right. So, so that can that, you just point out the theme in these grade lines that so we relate all to river corridors? Because currently municipalities have the authority to regulate landfill development in river corridors, in shorelands, mm -hmm. and flood hazard areas. But you're going to have a river corridor permitting program at A and R, so they won't be regulating river corridor development anymore in municipalities unless they're delegated. And right, I think it was that only 10 percent of municipalities was current, were currently regulated. So you you would need to know that, and so if that's your choice. You're going to probably have to strike this and add language about how municipalities can if they're delegated. Um, so that's that's the what the great the great matter right. is. Okay. And I only have a very small comment on page 21. The gray highlighted river corridor protection. Whatever happens with river corridors and their construct or change, we would change we would strike protection areas as river corridors. We wouldn't have the protection areas reference in there. Okay. That was a, a like a remnant from previous mapping efforts okay. that didn't include the buffer component. So so that that that's why river okay. corridors are grade. Anytime there's reference to it, it's grade. You just need to make that decision. So it's a 21, 22, 23. If River Porter stays, we would just ask the strike for protection of care. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so. 
And then the gray on page 25 in the study committee, the study committee as the language that was originally proposed would have recommended whether or not to have state minimum flood hazard area standards. But you already had that earlier in the bill. So, and then, so that's great just so you know that that yep. should come out. But it also now is great because you haven't made that decision yet. <laughs> so. Um, and then the transition implementation appropriations, that really all depends on what you decide to do. You know, if you're going to do flood hazard area bylaws uh, or not. Um, if you're, I, I, the transition depends on what you choose to do in those sections. Okay. So, uh, I stated my opinion. I don't <laughs> yeah, we, well, we've drafted um, with the assumption that we are going forward. And, the only question was, what was the regulatory, uh, the permitting granting and regulatory authority for it? Did that shift? Did it go to the state or did it stay municipal? Right? For the flood hazard area. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, for purposes of time, I'm not going to go over every section in the dam safety. Yeah. Because you've seen that a few times. Well, let's go to the thing that was the biggest. P well, now page 36 is a change. Um, it's in the it's in the hearing that will be held. Um, you wanted to be clear that the purpose of the public comment um, and was whether the project serves public good and whether it provides adequately for public safety. That had been the standard on page 37 lines one through 10, but that was struck. And there was a request for that to be reincorporated in as the, the purpose of the hearing. And then on page 38, so if the purpose of the hearing is public safety and the determination of what needs to be done, you don't need to conclude public safety under the CPG um, oh, yeah, we moved that. Which was, I believe, do you want that back in? Yeah, yeah. yeah Dylan's like you would lay on public affairs on behalf of Green Mountain Power. I think we would we'd like it to be in both places. I was going to like go to uh, oh, Mr. Green first. first. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, ben Green, uh, Section Chief Dam Safety Engineer. Um, yeah, we'd advocate for public safety to be in the public good criteria. That that list is not necessarily a priority list, and it's actually probably is why Blueberry is the most important thing to be in there. Um, value safety if it's not in there in my opinion okay so 16 through 19 on 36 are uh what agreeable to that we're just being more explicit wait no it's just removed as number 13. Yeah. Uh, sorry right. I didn't... page 38 line oh, sorry, 12 is long what light. what they want uh steady okay. they want the the structure to be removed it sounds like green mountain power is on the same page there yeah, that's that's right. I think we would like to see it in both places. And then just one additional comment on um, in 1085, the notice of application. Very appreciate <clears throat> that council has added um, public safety into there. Uh, we did just have the additional suggestion that uh, when it says the purpose of this public comment, add the words and review, just to make it explicitly clear that it's not just the public comment period to look at public safety, but the department's review. Um, would also include the consideration of public safety. Okay. I just for the record, this language that begins at the top of page 37 that's struck through is an explicit reference to the process that the PUC currently employs when they review dam modification yeah. projects. The agency doesn't use exactly the same process. I mean, we have we have a lengthy public process and project review process with the applicant. But from our perspective, the language that was pulled from the top of page 37 and stuck in section 1085 is not necessary. Our public comment period is there for anyone to comment on any aspect of the project that affects them. 
and putting these parameters around it doesn't seem to serve a purpose from our perspective. I mean, we, we obviously, the public comment period is for <coughs> comments on whether the project serves the public good and whether it complies with the requirements in 1086. Um, but it also, you know, we encourage comments on other aspects of the project as well, and we're not sure why this is moved in here. Okay, so for anyone who is speaking in favor of adding um, this explanation of things eligible to be commented on that are, if I understand you, Ms. Smith, already eligible to be commented on without it, what is the, who, who's arguing and why for this, the inclusion of lines 16 to 19? Mr. Zwicky? Yeah, uh, it's always like for um, I would think we would welcome suggestions for where else to include it. The impetus behind asking for the explicit calling out of public safety is that we don't just want public safety to be one of many considerations that the department takes into account when weighing these applications. It needs to be equally weighted against the other considerations. This is the, do you want to hit, you want public safety to be just one of many considerations. That does not seem to be in line with the sort of philosophical intent of moving this jurisdiction over to the department. So, Mr. Reed, I'm guessing that public safety always, I'll strike the word always, um, is, well, no, um, yeah. it's always a consideration. It's, it's our number one consideration. Yeah. Right. So, I'm, I'm just puzzled a little why, why we need to restate that if it's inherent in Chapter 170. Is it the section 1086 provision that you're wanting to highlight? So the concern here is that the department was giving due consideration to a list of 13 or 14 different inputs. Um, and I think we would argue that public safety should be given greater weight in that consideration than perhaps some of the other considerations there. You've heard testimony from dam owners that some of their for example, water quality permits prohibit them from drawing dams down. A key piece in the operation of a hydro facility in advance of a significant water event is to draw down water. We would not want to be put in a position of having to make the decision between violating a water quality permit or operating the dam to the greatest possible extent for public safety. And that, that's where we want public safety to be elevated. And right now, it, it would just be one of the main considerations. Has the state ever asserted that uh, there's a violation and then acted on it from like an environmental standpoint when environment and public safety could have been seen to be in com you know, competition with one another? I'm not aware of state's previous action, but it just your trouble troublesome to cover to a contingency. Okay. Uh, Ms. Smith then Center Lake. I think for the record, we don't disagree with Green Mountain Power's position. Um, the concern <coughs> is that this language seems to sort of limit what would be open for public comment, perhaps, or motivate what's open for public comment. And we don't want that outcome. We hear your concern about the, necess the necessity to consider public safety in the criteria for permitting. Um, that's all. Well, it feels like we're dancing around something. Yes. If there was an explicit statement about in um, when there is a conflict between mm -hmm. other permit, other considerations from public safety, public safety will Trump those other considerations. I don't know if we say that somewhere in law. You may not be able to because of like when the, the dam obligations. Yes, 
or the enforcement of the water quality standards. I don't know if you can say that any public safety standard or concern will supersede the water quality standards. There is discretionary enforcement though at the agency, right? The, there's they, always discretionary enforcement. They don't always do it correctly, but there's always discretionary enforcement. Thank you. Uh, at the risk of sort of editing on the fly, what if on page 37, under public good, where we start that list, and what it says, shall give due consideration to, among other things, the effect of the proposed blah, 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 blah. What if instead, to, if it was called out there, yes. shall give due consideration to public safety and, among other things, the effect, blah, blah, which sort of calls it out of the list, brings it to the top, recognizes that it's kind of the priority, but it is among other things. Yes, and to Senator Watson's point, that's what I was actually hoping to see when we made that change originally. But it seems like we've created this set, we've added to the notice of application section to answer that. I don't know why we didn't do it that way. But frankly, it feels like we're spending a lot of time on this. Um, so I'd be open to that point that Senator Watson is doing or just at not removing 13 and keeping it as is. I mean, I, I think either direction yes. would be. Yes. So just to clarify, it would say, shall give due considerations to, comma, public among safety. other things, comma, public safety okay. and the effect the proposed project will have on. Sure. That would work. But then when we take out the. When you take out public safety. Yes. yes. Well, you would be taking out public safety. No, no it's just moving. It's, it's more like highlighting it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I want to make sure I understood this, uh, Ms. Smith's comment that you wanted, you did not want public safety listed because you didn't invite public comment. No, 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 Senator. Well, I'm glad I asked that. We want we want public safety listed in 1086 as a consideration okay. for issuing the permit. Um, we, the state was confused or concerned perhaps about the addition of this explicit language in 1085, which then directs the public comment period to consider whether the public good is served, because from our perspective, that is inherent in the public comment period. That is the intent of okay. the state's comment period, is to get feedback on whether we're meeting the criteria outlined in 1086. So, we agree that, that the public safety is a legitimate thing. Absolutely. And that public comment is a good thing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Should I move on to the next change? Yes, <laughs> that would be on page 40. Next door. In 1089, you're striking that old, irrelevant language with the approval of the governor and striking the state agency having jurisdiction it's the department may require the engineer and then you have that question on page 40 lines 12 and 13 which you asked to gray or highlight differently uh, this had previously said the department shall review um, and approve or disapprove the report and there was questions about their authority to disapprove the screen. Uh, they're, uh, they're green. I just, um, as a general comment, the 1087 to 89 are a little awkwardly written as originally written. But um, I guess from the standpoint of the of the, of the program, um, I think the most important thing that kind of comes out of these two sections would be that that the the, the, the dam safety program uh, have engin engineering staff that carries out the, the requirements of the statute, and and uh, as currently written, it seems as though. It's getting away from potentially it could be read, read to get it, we're getting away from that. We're, we're not deploying anymore. We're requiring an engineer, um, and uh, so, so from that standpoint, it's it's uh, a little bit troublesome uh, to the program. Um, can you so uh, are you focusing on lines like eight through eleven? Ten, ten, eighty nine. Yeah. The engineer conducting an investigation under this section shall be an employee of the department or shall be operating under the supervision of the department as an independent consultant. Is that right? Well, a couple of things going on there, like in terms of 
how, how that would, you know, the, either we, 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 the engineering program, the, the density program needs to have engineers that can, can perform this work. There's going to be cases where that's not going to be possible, whether it's an emerging technology or something that we cannot have the expertise to yep. opine on. We're going to need to be able to get assistance. So we need to be able to have every uh, available way to do that, in my opinion. So we need to be able to hire someone to do it, or we need to be able to acquire an applicant to do that, which is probably more realistic, generally speaking, than the, the lab, but we, I, in my opinion, we have all avenues open to us to have that application reviewed by a um, <clears throat> capable and, and qualified engineer. Definitely. Okay, so um, I'm, a little, I'm a little slow on the uptake. The option here to either do it in-house or hire it out through an independent consultant, is that um, binding you in some way or is it that we're not, we don't offer the applicant is required to submit. What well, were the applicant required to do it? In addition, and again, the, the talk, back to the original sentence where it got struck at the top of 1089, with the approval of the governor and state agency of jurisdiction department, I used to say may employ, I guess. We've got to employ and put require an engineer. Um, so we're, are we necessarily requiring that the, the density program will be staffed by engineers? I'm worried that we're not. That's, that's my point. It's a highly Kind of the technical uh, department and potentially be staffed by non engineers. Senator Watson? Sorry, so you would prefer to go back to employ? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to. I, I, think, I, I, I think I would I refer to that and also just before a simple uh, one sentence statement that just says that, you know, that an engineer is defined, it will, you know, it's, the department will be. Um, run by engineers that are required to carry out the requirements of the statute, I think would be uh, helpful. I'm sorry, what, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, I think I have a statement here. Um, uh, sorry. It's all good. We'll be asking that the department shall employ an engineer or engineers to perform the duties required under the statute. Where would you put that? 10 and, and, and 10, 1089. Right, right at the right top the of that section. Okay. Instead of that first sentence. It's admittedly awkwardly written in an existing context, but yes. Because okay. I think one of the challenges here, I think, I think the original construction of this was, it was designed for both the PUC and the DEC and there's two different Ways that dams are historically regulated, and if we're trying to fold everything into fold everything into one under the department, then the department does the way the department does it. Um, Mr. Carpenter, uh, Chair Carpenter, Lake Champlain Committee, Mr. Chair, do you think this section is even needed anymore? You just strike the whole thing um, because, like you said, it's. It's written for the PUC to employ an engineer when you have engineers already employed, but you're also in consultants, so. Right, I, I mean, I guess I, I, my, my preference would be the statement I just, I just gave, and then we also have the caveat where we could you know, hire a consultant if we need it, because there's going to be potentially cases where there's emergent technology that we're not qualified to apply sure. We need assistance, or we have the authority to require the applicant to, to do that and submit the information to us for our review and approval. That's okay. the, the preference, I think. Sorry. So, well, thank you. I'm fine with that language that you suggested. Right. So if you could just send it over to Mr. O'Grady and then we'll highlight it and come back to it and again and see if we've landed in the right place. Some, some lead in the 10, 10 as well. Uh, okay. Right, that's the message. Um, so that takes you to page 41, liability for dam breach. You know, just that. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's pause there. I'm glad we finished the bill off this morning. It's really, <laughs> it's really surprising that we were able to do that in only uh, two hours. Uh, there's a couple of doozies later on, too. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to, we'll be revisiting our schedule. That it, actually, Thursday, Friday are blank, and it was not for nothing that they were blank. 
Um, <clears throat> all right. So if you can send those that language to Mr. O'Grady, then we can look at putting that in. I'm going to put my flag of we stop here uh, at top page 41. Did you have something before we before I flag that? Did you have something you wanted to say in a prior section? Uh, unfortunately, I have a small list of prior sections. Uh, yes, we sort of skipped over. Okay, so why don't you send any suggestions for 1087 and 89 for Mr. O'Grady, and then when we pick back up, we can see it in writing, and it'll be helpful for people to make decisions having it laid out. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Some edits are easier than others. This is one of the more challenging. Uh, I'm, Mr. Brady, are you in committee or meetings for the balance of the day? I'm thinking I might want it. Then I would like to be able to catch up and. I am not. I'm going to be redrafting this bill. Okay. <laughs> so I will uh, like to make an appointment for this afternoon to visit you uh, while you're redrafting and okay. see if we can um, do some clarifications that will help us get a little further for tomorrow. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, um, please watch the agenda. I think we, for instance, yeah, we may make some adjustments so we stay on this task uh, until we've finished. And then, for instance, the uh, visit with the secretary on budget, we don't need to hear the budget before we finish the work on this. So we we'll reschedule to give us time back. Okay, thank you everyone and we are adjourned.